Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Jason Schreier for a discussion of his latest book, Press Reset, Ruin and Recovery in the Video Game Industry, in conversation with Kirk Hamilton. Tonight's event is part of our ongoing virtual event series. As we remain digital for the time being, we're so excited to continue the work of bringing authors and their writing to our community during these difficult times. Especially now, it is through the support of authors and our beloved readers that we are able to make events like this happen. So thank you so much for continuing to show up for us week after week. For tonight's event, we will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A function wherever it may live on your Zoom display where you can submit all of your questions. We will get through as many as the time allows. If you go to the chat section, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your copies of Press Reset. If you already have a copy of the book or would like to contribute to the series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation function. We greatly appreciate any and all support you were able to extend to us at this time. And lastly, as you have probably experienced during virtual gatherings this last year, technical issues might come up. If any technical glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and your understanding. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Jason Schreier is the author of Blood, Sweat and Pixels, the triumphant turbulent stories behind how video games are made. He's a reporter at Bloomberg News and previously spent eight years at Kotaku, one of the biggest video game websites in the world. His extensive coverage of the video game industry has been featured in other outlets, including Wired, The New York Times, Edge, Paste, Kill Screen, and The Onion News Network. Tonight, he is joined in conversation by Kirk Hamilton, a musician, writer, and co-host and producer of the popular video game podcast, Triple Click. He spent most of the 2010s as an editor for Kotaku and has written for Paste, Acoustic Guitar Magazine, New York Times, and elsewhere. This evening, they'll be discussing Jason's latest book, Press Reset, Ruin and Recovery in the Video Game Industry, a gripping and deeply researched investigation of the volatile world of gaming that Kirkus Review calls an informed, well-balanced report on the video game industry's passions and pitfalls. Based on dozens of firsthand interviews with the people who made some of the most iconic games, Press Reset unveils the calamity behind the technology, highlighting hostile takeovers, abusive bosses, widespread lack of funding, as well as that one time Kurt Schilling tried to take on World of Warcraft. At a time when video games are at the peak of their popularity, this book is an important reminder that popularity does not always guarantee security, and that behind some of the most captivating fantasies are communities of workers just struggling to survive. We're so excited to be hosting this event tonight. Without further ado, I'm delighted to turn things over to our speakers now. The digital podium is all yours, Jason and Kirk. Hey. Hello. Hi. Hello. It's Hello, not quite everyone. the same effect uh, just turning on your camera on Zoom as no. it is like coming out to the audience. I think there would be a the band, booster. right? Like, da 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 da. Yeah. And then the lights well, would you'll have to play for us right now. Okay? <laughs> right, I should. <laughs> a lot of guitars I in the background know. for you not to That's be playing true. us a live show right now. That's true. By the way, I like, Kirk, I like how in your bio you have Acoustic Guitar Magazine before the New York Times. I like putting that in there because it's just kind of an eyebrow raiser. I think I like did a couple of lessons for them forever ago, but it's just sort of fun. Amazing. And then, yeah, the New York Love Times it. is like, yeah, them too. Yeah, them, and the Times. <laughs> Acoustic Guitar Magazine. Importantly, yeah, I taught the, people the how to use metronomes. 
Um, Man, um, hey there. <laughs> I so, guess you could say both are the paper of record in a way. <laughs> that's true. That's true for their for their respective uh, areas of interest. So you and I have never met or spoken before, but here we are just getting to no, know each other pleasure. right now. It's, uh, it's good to it's, meet you. It's nice to meet you. I really liked your book. Um, <laughs> oh, thank I'm excited, you. I appreciate I'm excited that. to talk to you about video games. I feel like that might be a fun thing. Uh, for you and me to do like we, we should might. talk about video games um, of course i'm i'm kidding i think everybody knows that i mentioned triple click in my bio but you didn't in yours but jason and i make a podcast mm-hmm. together anybody watching this who doesn't listen to triple click they probably do but they might not and i'm gonna tell them that and i'm gonna talk to you about your wonderful new book today which i've done a bit of already but i feel like there's always more to say there is always more when it comes to the video game industry you never run out of things to talk about. <laughs> that is one one beneficial thing about the video game industry that's no true. shortage of takes no, no shortage of takes. Um, how are you feeling now that the book is out? It's good. It's it's the last couple of weeks have just been like an exhausting ride of just like interview after interview after interview. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I'm I've come to like the tail end of that, and I can just kind of relax a little bit, which has been nice. But nice. still got this this book tour, the virtual book tour, right. which is we're getting been the, fun. Like, the most exhausted version of you. You've already answered every question possible, and it's just... it's true. Although I was I, I had the weekend to like relax. That's true. My Mm -hmm. wife and toddler were at my in-laws, so I was all by myself, and I could be like, oh, man, I'm just going to lie on the couch watching Mythic Quest all all Friday night. That was nice. I feel like watching Mythic Quest after writing a book about the video game industry might not be the most relaxing thing you could possibly do. It is because it's still it's it's actually kind of like, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure game developers have an an interesting reaction to that show. But Mm -hmm. for me, it's got it feels so true that it's actually really cool to watch because I feel like it's the first show. Um, we're already going off the rails. This is what Triple Click is like, by the way. Sorry, everybody. Um, <laughs> we'll get there. Like we're talking Mythic about Quest, video games. And that's what no, Mythic Quest is, is a good segue because it's it's the first show I've seen um, mm-hmm. that actually nails the truth, as far as I understand it, of what like working in games is like. There's this great scene in the second season where the creative director is talking to an artist and he's yes. like being patronizing and like telling him like like here no this is this is not what i had in mind i want you to do this i want you to do this and the artist is like uh you're asking me to do this on top of the work i'm already doing and he's talking about like pulling an all-nighter and and uh <laughs> the creative what? director's like i just i want to see the magic and the artist is like it's not magic it is hard work <laughs> it's, just, it's my job he's like yeah. i have a master's in fine art God, yeah i like yeah. the joke where he's like oh you guys are amazing you guys do it just like magic you just make this every time they're like Yep. Yeah, it's our job. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, that is God. that is kind of a good segue. They get at some truths, even if it is a little exaggerated. So this book, I've talked to you about this book before. I've read the book. I think it's a great book. I think that everybody here listening should buy it because it offers an interesting insight into video games, but also into just the nature of corporate collaborative creative work, like which is just a hugely varied, really complicated world that is so hard to pin down, so hard to describe in any kind of a way because it's so many interlocking systems mixing with like all of these economic incentives on like levels all the way up from like top huge, like publicly traded corporations down to very small independent, uh, you know, LLCs run by one guy. Um, So you have to tell a story that encompasses all of that. And I think you kind of do. I mean, like you at least hit it a lot of different Uh, vectors of the video game industry. And I'm curious, I want to hear a little more about your process just in assembling the story of this book, because unlike your first book, this book has more of a coherent story to it. You've said this before that you were trying to knit together these different stories into one overarching narrative. How did you go about doing that? Just you have all these characters, you have all these events, you know, there's kind of the main big things, 38 Studios, Bioshock, things that happened to 2K Marin, they're all kind of related. What was your approach to coming up with a narrative that made sense out of all of those pieces? Yeah, it kind of sprung from the reporting. I mean, first of all, the important thing for this book, as opposed to my first book, which was just a collection of like game development stories about how each game got made. And it was all, they were all kind of loosely together by, tied by, tied loosely together by themes of like, crunch and this is how games actually happen and and the hellish experiences that people have to go through Um, with this book it was more like I want this all to be one story about what happens to people when game studios shut down and then it happened that as I was reporting I kind of followed threads that the reporting led me to which is often how these things work as you're talking to one person and you ask hey who else should I talk to and they lead you to three more people and those people tell you a story you haven't heard before and you're like wow that's Mm -hmm. really interesting so what happened with um, this book is 
I knew I wanted to do 38 and I knew I wanted to do Irrational. And those were some of the earlier decisions that I made um, because I knew both of those stories were absolutely fascinating and kind of like uh, representative of, of some of the problems that, that I wanted to tackle here. And with Irrational as an example, going down the Irrational route led me to 2K Marin. And I was like, oh, this story is kind of like undertold. And not a lot of people realize that this story just suddenly vanished one day that, that after studio, going through yeah. this disastrous development of this XCOM game, suddenly the studio was no more. Um, and then it also led me down the route of finding the folks who made the, uh, the Flame and the Flood, the Molasses Flood, that studio, um, which I found, I thought was an interesting enough story to also be a chapter on its own. Um, and then from there, I also knew, um, maybe kind of subconsciously, I knew that I wanted to do a story about War Inspector and that it would be tied together with this. But I had kind of like independently thought I wanted to go and talk to War Inspector. So I flew out to Austin and met with him and told his story. And then kind of putting the book together, I was like, wait a minute, War Inspector's story directly leads into the lineage. Like his, 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 it's like his disciples all went and made Bioshock and mm -hmm. all these other games. So yeah, it was, it was not hard to connect the stuff. It also happens that the video game industry is really small. So as I was reporting, it's like suddenly people would turn up in all these places. Like here's a good example. When I was doing, I was doing the chapter on Mythic Entertainment, which is a company, a well-known company back in the day behind like Dark Age of Camelot, which people used to love back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and I spoke to a woman named Carrie Guskos, who's uh, one of one of the characters in that chapter. And, and I, I, I told her story for that chapter. And then we, um, last March, when we started hearing about something called COVID-19, um, I found out that she was actually heading up this effort at Bungie to start working remotely. And it turns out that like in the last chapter of the book, I was covering the remote work like as a solution mm -hmm. to some of these problems, which we can get into a little later. But I was like, oh my God, this is perfect. Like Carrie, who I already knew and have been talking to is suddenly in this other role that fits perfectly for the narrative. So so a lot of stuff like that kind of worked out nicely. Um, and yeah, no, it was uh, it was it was an interesting challenge trying to turn it all into into one story. I feel like it was kind of a hybrid between the a book that's one story and my last book where it was an anthology. And I think if I write another book, maybe I don't know if I do another book, I, I want to try to do one big story that is isn't an anthology at all. So this was kind of like the stepping stone on that route. Right, that kind of makes sense. Like you start with an explosion and then follow the shrapnel in any given direction sure, yes which does seem like that was kind of your approach did you think of it like top down like that like you start with the implosion of this studio and then sort of start talking to people and you'll see where they all wound up and and what they're doing yeah i mean one of the things i knew going into the book is that i didn't want to focus just on the big named people like i i, yeah. I knew that i was going to do like a war inspector thing and there would be some talk about ken levine and kurt schilling but also i knew that i wanted to follow just like some individual people's stories that don't get told that often which is one of the things i wanted to do there and yeah i guess you could call them the shrapnel but um yeah no i mean it turns out that like most people in the games industry are actually like have a fascinating story and a lot of them just have done really interesting things and that it kind of surprised me as I was doing the reporting like how much interesting stuff I found out from people about their own journeys like that that is something I hadn't realized until really I started this process is how many interesting stories are out are out there do you think that there's maybe like a a more difficult side of that for a writer, given that there are so many interesting stories that you can only tell so many. And so if you like trace down so many people, you know, they'll tell you about, oh, my friend would talk to you and you kind of get this self-selecting sample, but there probably are other people that you're not hearing from. Do you worry about that? That there's like, you're missing out on stories that could create a more whole version of the narrative that happens to me every day like every day as a reporter <laughs> it's like you always hear more stories than you could ever have time to write mm -hmm. about um so yeah i mean i i try not to worry about it i try just to focus on on things things that are seem interesting yeah i don't know and i guess the b-sides of of a uh, press reset still gives you the sense of the industry that you have to be able to tell the story that you're choosing to tell. Like you're having to edit it, right? On some level, you can't yeah. just relay every story that's that's told to you. Yeah, and also it's it's not that like, like sometimes for your book, you need to pick ones that make sense and are coherent and like fit nicely mm -hmm. into the narrative. So you can't just tell everybody's story. And so like when you're talking about nonfiction, you're talking about people's lives, you have to like, and you also have to shape that into a narrative where there are arcs and like people want things and you yeah. know, get or don't get them and face obstacles and it's yeah it's an interesting experiment how do you think of that challenge of like creating a narrative out of something that actually happened to someone 
and your own narrative like like do you worry about forcing your own narrative onto it and being like well this needs to fit in so i'm just not going to tell that part of the story and just fit this part in yeah that's such an interesting it's like a journalist challenge is to yeah. avoid doing that and oftentimes that happens when you come into a story with preconceived notions of what it already is which is like like one of those fundamental problems that journalists have is like you set out to be like okay i want to tell this story about how this person did x and on the way to y they found z but then it turns mm -hmm. out that they did x and and then on the way to why they found a instead here's an interesting example so um one of i thought it would fit neatly so okay so in the chapter about big huge games in in press reset i talked to these guys who um worked in what they called the combat pit where they would all work really closely together and like they would all there were some animators and some designers and they would iterate on things and they would be like staring at a screen and playing the controller and they all had a blast together they had like these frat house antics that maybe aren't that great but like yeah. they had fun the words, they had fun frat, frat house antics no longer play like they yeah, yeah 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 i mean some certainly some pros and cons there sure. but like they had a lot of chemistry and that that was really important for like the actual work and allowed them to do like some really cool things with the combat and so one of them told me that like they often talked about this idea of like going off and starting a company together called just add combat where like they would be work for hire and people would hire them like hey i want to do combat in my game come do this and so when I was interview, I, I was I had been interviewing and doing a bunch of interviews with this guy Joe Cadera, who led the combat pit. And so, in a later chapter, when I started digging into the concept of outsourcing as one of the potential solutions to some of the industry's problems, and this idea of like, okay, if if the industry really works like a gig economy, then maybe we can have different like outsourcing studios, and they can help protect their workers. And instead of just like having to bounce around, people can like work for one of these studios. And that's essentially I, I envision that structure in my head. So I figured. I would talk to Joe and be like, oh, this is a great segue. This is a great tie in to earlier in the chapter because I can be like, hey, you might want to, would you do just add combat one day? And his answer to me was no. And I, I was like, man, that's so frustrating. Like this would have been perfect in, in the chapter there. But then I realized that it's still perfect in the chapter because it's just an interesting wrinkle to that story. And that, mm -hmm. that to me, I think is a good example of like that sort of thing where like sometimes even if the narrative isn't exactly what you expected going into it, it can still be really interesting. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have to, um, it can be a little messy because nonfiction is always going to be a little messy because humans are messy and like sometimes their actions don't make sense and sometimes they don't do what you think they're going to do. Yeah. It's funny that that specific example where that would be this nice solution or one possible solution to some of the problems that you're laying out in the book, the sort of insecurity and volatility, the way that people are always losing their jobs and having to relocate. It'd be really nice to hear from the guy, like you said, if he's like, yeah, this this thing we're gonna, we wanted to do seems like it'd be perfect and we're doing it and it's working great. And you could kind of have this concrete example of a solution. I can sense in the book, I reread the whole kind of last whatever third of the book maybe mm -hmm. where you're feeling the pressure or like feeling the that the book wants to have some kind of a conclusion that you're gonna say to people okay here are the solutions now to all of these problems that i've laid out even while i can tell that you're also and i know you also that you're kind of resisting that because you're like you're like well who am i to be telling you what to do like you know i'm, I'm just talking to everybody and trying to tell this story um but it's still there, like the union thing, that's like one possible solution. Outsourcing is one that then gets kind of like muddled. Um, the working remotely could solve some things, but then also like the COVID, like COVID happened recently enough in the writing of the book that it feels like it happened at the end. Did you feel like there was more you could have said about possible solutions or are there people you wish you could have talked to or examples you wish you could have cited? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that if I had written the book a little bit later, I mean, who could have known? I finished most of it in like January, February of last year. So right before right. COVID started, I think if I had had more of an opportunity, like spent more time with the book, which I didn't want to do for obvious reasons and couldn't do, um, I would have done more COVID research and like research into remote work and how that's working out for people. But I mean, I have an yeah. opportunity to do that as a journalist, like yeah, moving absolutely. forward. I think what's interesting about these books and someone asked me the other day if uh, if I ever would want to do like a secret to blood sweat and pixels is but like focusing on like cyberpunk after doing the witcher 3 or like destiny 2 after doing destiny and i was like i mean first of all that no because it's not interesting to me to like do the same sort of book again i want to do different things but second mm -hmm. of all i actually like that it exists as the snapshot in time of like this is destiny's life this is the witcher's cd project's life here and i i feel the same way with press reset that like this book examined remote work 
as it was in this point. And maybe one day, like there'll be more to say about remote work and we can get into that more. And I'm sure there will be like more conversations, especially as we're getting out of the pandemic, at least here in the US. And so, yeah, very, very curious to see what happens next. But but I don't really feel like that sad about it being missing in the book. And to your point, yeah, I mean, I do feel like as a reporter, sometimes it's like, so for this book, I knew I wanted to do I wanted to write solutions and explore solutions because I didn't want this to be just a book that was like, here are terrible right. things and, and you should feel horrible about them. I wanted to have some, some level of optimism towards that. the sounds end. Like kind of, sounds like a really great read for this point in my life. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, but you're right. Um, your instinct is right that, that I always have a, a, a tendency to want to just like let the reporting speak for itself and not be like, like I'm going to lecture people on what they should do at this, in this industry I've never actually worked in so yes i'm always a little bit hesitant to go that route um but i think that like i had enough stuff that was backed up by people i spoke to like i wasn't going to be like i believe this because i believe it um unless i'd spoken to people and had the reporting to actually like back up the solutions that i was proposing right yeah you, the unionization part of this which does seem like it has potential to be so helpful in so many ways also strikes me as a challenge because there isn't a concrete example of a video game studio that's unionized yet. Uh -huh. So it's hard to like, let, let it tell its own story. Like you can't just go and say, well, so-and-so did it. And, and I talked to them happened, and this yeah. is what they said. And we talked to these people they worked with and, you know, these were the pros and the cons and their experience of the first time doing it. So it's just, it still feels like this kind of frustratingly empty space a little bit like it's like someone just needs to do it do you ever feel yeah, that way I mean, like at just least you, someone you can, please you can draw the parallels between that and media and i did a little bit in the book yeah, not so much but some, but you can be like ways, right? i mean i could be like i can draw from my own personal experiences there and be like True. look hey our union contract had severance so when we got new owners and they laid right. people off they had to be paid for like two months or whatever it was after they were let go um and if 38 studios had severance then maybe it would have shut down two months earlier and and everybody, if they had a union, maybe when it shut down, uh, sure. it would have shut down two months earlier and they would have gotten severance instead of it shutting down suddenly because they ran out of money. Maybe legally they wouldn't have been able to do that. So um, I feel like you can you can definitely bring up like potential benefits. But yeah, no, it is a bummer that like there's right. no actual instance of this happening. Maybe right. soon, maybe. I don't maybe. know. Maybe it's, yeah, it's challenging because there's definitely a lot of people like in games and in tech who are just super skeptical of the idea. And it's like, fair enough, you know, like, be skeptical it would be really cool to be able to say to someone who is skeptical and yeah, here's an example of here. like yeah. and it did these these positive things um and it wasn't you know whatever the fake cure-all that some people claim that people are saying that mm -hmm, it's going to be mm -hmm. if it just worked in some instances to make things a little bit better but it's hard when even when you're drawing from your experience right like oh well at my blog we unionize and a lot of i mean i feel like <laughs> your average game developer might just be like whatever like stop talking to me <laughs> yeah i mean I think one of the things that's useful, I mean, in this book, you can look at like disbelief, which is one of the companies I spotlighted in that last chapter and be like, I mean, this is basically a union. The only problem is that they're kind of still held to, they have to rely on the generosity of management. But like when they as an outsourcing house are working with other companies, they act as a union because they're negotiating right. a contract and like, like looking out for this group of people. So that I think is an interesting way of doing things. And especially when you look at a company like disbelief that has like um, transparency salary and stuff like that it really does right. feel like a, a it could be a union shop maybe one day they'll unionize and that'll be a good model for everybody but like that's the type of thing that that i think can be helpful to look at but also mm -hmm. i mean 51 percent or well so 54 percent in the survey i cited in the book um 51 in the most recent survey so about the same more than half of game developers want to unionize and then like another yeah. 20 something are on the fence so it curious? feels like it's going to happen the only question yeah. is like what is it going to look like? Yeah, which it will be. Yeah, I'm sure that'll be in in your next book. Every um, year we predict it uh, on our true, on triple sorry. click, and it never happens. That's true. Did we predict it this year? I think we might. I don't remember. I feel like we maybe finally gave up, which means yeah. that'll that'll be the year that. Which happens. means it'll happen. Yeah. I guess we. It's really our fault. We need to stop predicting that it's going to happen. Um, <laughs> is there one interview that you wish you could have gotten for this book that you weren't able to get? Yeah. Um, did I tell you about this? I was, uh, mm -hmm. I, I was talking to Kurt Schilling, um, who was the, oh, really? the creator, founder yeah, of 38 yeah. Studios. Yeah. We were like, also, I think I a pretty good him. baseball player. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've heard about um, him anyway. now, now, now best known for 
<laughs> right yeah. wing provocateurs. Well, right. Um, yeah. So I was talking to him. I, I exchanged some emails with him, then went moved to text. I got on the phone with him. He, he was interested in talking to me, but then he just ghosted. Like he just stopped responding and mm. it got to the point where I was nearing the end of production on the book. And I was like, I, I, Hey, do you want to talk? And he just like, like he would, he would, I would text him. He would respond a month later being like, Hey, yeah, like I'm down to chat. And then mm. he would stop responding. It was really wild but That's yeah no i would have loved to talk to him because i had so many questions for him i also would have loved to talk to ken levine who through a spokesperson also declined to comment and yeah. um really most of the management in this story i would have liked to hear their perspectives um because i think that's lacking but like for many reasons they never want to talk for about this stuff they believe that <laughs> staying silent is better for them right which is i guess makes sense it's it's challenging for the story in a way like it's cool that you tell the story that's very ground level like you'll just follow a developer around throughout their career or at various points you know as they come into one place and go out of another place and it gives a kind of very humanistic feel for the games industry which i think given the games press's long sort of bias the other direction where it's always like it, you're always talking to Ken Levine about Bioshock mm -hmm. you're never going to talk about talk to the QA lead or the whatever yeah. you know like fifth in line you know level designer about Bioshock they're not getting brought out to the press it's always right. the people at the top and it's so the then people, you get yeah whose who's work is trickling down and and screwing them over yeah right and like then you but then the the stuff that's like the real business you know when people go to to tell the truth or whatever, like the harsh stuff that always tends to come from the people who aren't, you know, at the very top since they kind of are maybe more frustrated with how things are going. Well, yeah, they're living it and they're not getting million dollar right. salaries along the way. So it's kind of a corrective, like the book is a little bit of a corrective since you're amplifying those voices. But right, it's I, I guess it would, would you worry if you did have more of those kinds of people at the top talking that it would just keep the status quo of how things usually are we're like we're always hearing the perspective of the person at the top who says hey look video games are hard to make you got to break a few eggs etc well that kind of happened with my first book and my first book talks to a lot of people at the top and mm, um, one of the things i did with that book and this was i mean i guess i kind of regret it in retrospect but it was by design that i let those voices speak for themselves so when you have someone like um neil Druckmann at naughty dog uh the creative director and, and a vp now talking about how like um crunch is inevitable when you try to make game of the year i wanted to present that as it was and i think in retrospect and certainly some of the criticism i saw uh, of blood sweat and pixels was that i didn't go hard enough on that stuff i thought mm -hmm. a lot of people would read it and and kind of judge for themselves but it is what it is um but yeah the first book definitely had some of those voices and i think a lot of them got pretty candid um people people in that book about like what it takes to make games so i don't think i i think that's lacking from the second book because the second book um didn't actually i don't think i got any like quote unquote pr approval um interviews yeah, for not, this huh? book actually, it's all think just, about that, but, yeah, yeah so the uh, as opposed to the first book where i was going around to companies and talking to people pretty officially i went out to naughty dog i went out to cd right. project um in poland and this was all like official approval pr um sometimes sitting in the room sometimes not but but they know that this is happening as opposed to a lot of these studios which don't exist anymore and so by definitely like i can't talk to the pr people and get official approval i just am talking to former employees um mm -hmm. and as a result i mean a lot of some people don't want to relive that stuff some people just don't want to go on the record and i i spoke to i reached out to like some executives like christoph hartman who was the executive in charge of 2k when when the 2k marin stuff was happening i reached right. out to him didn't want to speak um even though he's not a 2k anymore so i gave a lot of, i gave all these people opportunities to chat they just didn't want to do it. Um, I do think I, I, I wish I could have heard their perspective, certainly, but I think the book is like, I don't think the book needed them because of what the book is trying to do. Like very specifically, I say up front in the book that this book is not interested in like looking at the business decisions and the numbers and stuff. This book is interested right. in looking at the, the human effects and the stories of people afterwards. So it didn't really need as high level a look as, um, as as those executives would have brought to the table as much as i would have loved to hear but even even if i got those executives on the record like it's not like they would be that candid it would be like oh yeah it was really sad when we had to uh when we had to realign those resources at 2k but uh <laughs> they but, maybe wouldn't be that cold but yeah I, yeah it's funny that you i feel like when 
people just who play video games hear the stories of layoffs or studio closures, it's usually framed in terms of, there's always a kind of a, oh, those poor developers, like that's part of it, but it's always kind of abstract. And then it's just like, oh, well, those games they made were so good. They're not going to make any more of them. That really sucks. Mm -hmm. um, which is, a you know, sort of understandable on, on some levels just to think, well, I like this is, this was the way that I interacted with the studio is playing right. my games. Right. But it's nice to read a book that explores the actual just, and it's not always like the human costs, but the actual human effects of some of those decisions. Like it's not always so hardcore. A lot of times right. it's just yeah. people just have to make different choices in their life. Or like and a lot of times people get job. severance. There are a lot of humane shutdowns sure. in the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people who find success doing other things and it winds up being a lot of times that sort of closes the door, opens a window kind of a situation. I also wonder about just thinking back on Blood, Sweat, and Pixels and the way that you talk to more people who are in charge. It's really easy to, I think that there's a lot of truth. Like people are very willing to tell the truth when they're at the top of one of those projects or when they're at the bottom about how hard it is and how they have different incentives and they're, they're playing different roles in the company. And they made understandable decisions for their role in the company, depending on what it was. It's just that when the person in charge makes this decision to like, whatever, add this feature to the game or cut this feature to the game and do all of this crunch and like, you know, greatly expand the scope here, it has all these downstream effects on the people at the bottom. When the people at the bottom are like doing their best, you know, and then kind of destroying their lives over it, like that has all these downstream effects on their lives and the people in them everyone's kind of doing their best, I guess. So anyone you talk to is going to tell you a version of the story where they did their best, like mm -hmm. given the circumstances. And that, so then it kind of winds up, it's like you have this huge, very challenging, very complicated place where everyone's kind of doing their best, or at least 80% of people are doing their best. And you have to choose how to present that or what you think the most valuable stories to tell are. Mm. I guess it's another way of asking the first question that I asked you, but I'm curious to hear more about how you approach making that decision. Yeah, well, also part of it is that people are always willing to talk about the obstacles when the end result is success. And in this mm, in this book, that's true. all the end results are <laughs> failure. Like that's that's a large part of it. But yeah, uh, no, it's true. it's it's interesting. I mean, I think that like you have to contextualize the doing doing the best they could. And sometimes if someone's doing the best they could, but it's hurting a lot of people like maybe you have to ask like why is that how mm. could that be better should that person really be in the position that they are um and i think this book explores a little bit of touches on a little bit of that stuff even though that's not the point of the book um to your earlier point by the way i think um the the humanizing these stories i think was really important to me and like someone asked me a few people have asked me what are the goals of this book what was your goal when writing the book and i think First and foremost, my goal was just to like inform people and entertain them and make them feel like they come away from this book having enjoyed it and learned something. Um, but I think also one of my goals is to make it so like when people go off and read uh, a story that is like Activision lays off 800 people instead of just seeing that number and just kind of numbly looking at it, they maybe think about some of the people and, and how they could be like uh uh gwen frey or zach mumbach or any of the other the, the other people in the, the stories um mm -hmm. and just kind of like try to try to empathize a little bit more i guess that's that's one of the goals as well so hopefully hopefully it does it does its job there yeah i think about that a lot about like naming specific developers and reviews of games or like shouting mm -hmm. out the departments of people who worked on a game that mm -hmm. don't necessarily get credit. Yeah, like what was the, that review you did that for? The Red, was... Red Dead 2. Right, that Red was like Dead. the first yeah, time yeah. I'd ever done that. And I remember being like, why didn't I do this in every review I've ever yeah. written? It was the last game review I ever wrote. And and thinking that that could be a great project of game journalism is just to do a better job of that. And not in a, it's easy to read it kind of smarmily, yeah. like as a kind of smarmy, like people worked on this. Like you yeah. can come off that way, but it really could, it really is an important thing. And it is something that I think a lot of people don't think about. And it's, it's very similar to what you're saying with the, uh, you know, when you read about layoffs or studio closure in the same breath as something about, you know, the massive profits of the video game industry, which I know is a sort of a contrast or a like discrepancy that you're aiming to highlight that these video games make so much money that the people in the C-suite at various video game companies are billionaires, are making incredible amounts of money. Meanwhile, there's this endless churn and sort of stress and torment at, at times. Torment is yeah. maybe a little bit, a little bit overwrought, but there's, there's a lot of, you know, challenges for people farther down on the totem pole. 
Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, to that point, I think the whole conversation of like naming people as opposed to brands and paying attention to people as opposed to brands has been going on mm -hmm. for a long time. But brands are people, Jason. I don't know. Yeah, brands are people. No, but it's it's friend. like I think because games are such a like creative collaboration and it's so difficult to really isolate like who did what mm -hmm. on a games project. I mean, similarly to how in a TV writers room, like everybody is working mm -hmm. on the same script and like plotting out the beats and like every script might have credit edits that are like oh this was written by this person but in in mm -hmm. reality it was the entire writer writers room that had a lot of input on that and then the showrunner probably gave it a rewrite and it's like a whole it's such a collaborative process and i think games are the same way especially when you're talking about like stuff that is multidiscipline like this feature that you love in a game was done by a designer and an artist and a programmer and a sound person mm -hmm. and a ui person and all these other people who just combine so it's it can be really difficult and that's why we as gaming fans tend to just put all this value on the auteur and the person at the very top because it's easier <laughs> it's easier and you know yeah. that like okay this person was making a lot of the creative decisions and like having the meetings and giving feedback to people and so yeah. so okay we can give this person credit there um but it's a lot more difficult to be to look in the credits of a game and be like okay this senior programmer was responsible for that uh the way the guns felt in this game and so i'm i'm really proud of them it's like impossible and i think that that's a really difficult thing to solve. Like, how do you solve that problem? Um, I, mm -hmm. I think there, the one thing that has been kind of cool to see over the past few years is the rise of Twitter. And I know you hate Twitter, but as a <laughs> wow, as a that's result, not what I was expecting you to say. As the a result of, of Twitter, Twitter <laughs> as a result of Twitter, a lot more game developers have become more yeah. prominent and known among gaming fans. And there are a lot of gaming fans on Twitter who don't just follow like Kideo Kojima, but also follow mm -hmm. these other people down the chain at these game companies. And like maybe they're posting some of their concept art or like their favorite features in the game that they worked on. And that can help humanize them. And so that's been one like of the few benefits of Twitter in this world um is is like being able to humanize those people and i, I bet sure. you a lot more gamers like know who uh, a couple of like the designers on their favorite game or a couple of the artists on their favorite game as a result of that i feel like animator twitter is really good animators seem to be very a very opinionated bunch there's always times where animators will be sounding off on some amazing yes. thing it wasn't like a naughty dog trailer they're like look at this thing that ellie just did in this trailer yeah. give me a break and it was like people explaining how difficult it is to do that mm -hmm. it yeah it's fascinating and and twitter actually makes it really easy to share like gifs and clips and stuff like yeah. that which can be really helpful because you can really get to know someone's work and like see a little bit behind the sausage so, so that, that great, i think is really no cool. downsides nothing bad ever no, happened not twitter, that is our takeaway here yeah. it's just fine <laughs> for everybody um so Here's a thought that that this this is making me think um, because it's really all about my thoughts here. At, yeah, your, well, that's what, that's what matters. That's what matters. There's so going back to the idea of the combat of Jokadera's combat pit. This was a group of people within the studio that were working on one aspect of the game. I'm trying to think, and I know I'm like blanking on an example, but I feel like there are examples of this where a studio, like if studios just did a did a little bit more. Um, identifying subgroups within the studio publicly, then mm. you could know like, oh, those Capcom, the, like this team of people at Capcom who are like are responsible for X, Y, or Z, like they're yeah. also working on this. And it would be a way of sort of more personalizing what is mm. still a collaborative group of people because it's obviously never going to just be, oh, that one person like went over and like did all the animations for Monster Hunter or whatever. But like having those subgroups could you ever see something like that happening? Does that make sense? What I'm yeah, saying? I've seen that. I feel like Bungie has done that a lot, where they'll like highlight on mm. their blog like the raid team and this is oh, the team true. you they know yeah. vaults of glass and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that's really cool to see. Anything that's like more transparency at some of these game companies, which is so friggin' opaque, um, right. I think can just be really beneficial to everybody. Um, mm. More of more of that stuff. But yeah, no, there are definitely and like blogs, like company big companies tend to highlight people on their blogs and like like show off some of that stuff um but it, it also it feels very sanitized because it's very pr friendly and like oftentimes you'll see like sure. a q a on the playstation blog and you look at the questions and you're like man this is it's like so what's your favorite part about working being part of the playstation <laughs> family and it's like oh my god right right but yes yeah, no like... that would that would be cool to see for sure yeah there's some kind of a middle ground that's a good point that bungie does it like 
games as a service games tend to be more transparent about the process of making the game because mm -hmm. it behooves them to do that to tell their players what's going on since they want to keep them around and if you're like we're going to need a couple months to fix this thing we broke or whatever like you know you want to be explaining to them so you get those posts at bungie that are you know going back to the luke smith days of halo or whatever where he'd be like running down all of the members on assault rifles or whatever yeah um, yep, yep, yep. then in a game like I like at a studio like Naughty Dog or whatever, any of those big Sony uh, studios that make these incredible one-off single player games. That's a lot more like on the PlayStation blog now, an interview with so-and-so yeah, so yeah. designer about how much it rocks working on Horizon mm -hmm. Forbidden West or whatever. The other thing is that sometimes you'll see like designers, uh, depending on the studio, a lot of studios handle game development in different ways, but mm -hmm. some studios, they give a designer ownership over like a specific level or a specific part of the game. Yeah. And so that you'll see that designer talking about that. Um, but you have to kind of know to look for it, um, mm -hmm. which I don't know how many people are actually going off and doing that. Like a lot more people yeah. know who Neil Druckmann is as an example. Right, that stuff happens at GDC a lot more too, at like kind of mm -hmm. lesser visible conferences. Like I'm forgetting his name now. It was a guy I think who was actually at 2K Marin. You might know his name, who worked on Bioshock and he like did Fort Frolic, I think. Yeah, and Jordan he, Thomas, yeah, yeah. Jordan Thomas, that's his name, yes. Mm -hmm. And like there's a YouTube video, I think IGN maybe ran it, where it's just him playing through Fort Frolic and like mm -hmm. explaining everything about it. And it's great. Yeah. I'm like, this is what I want to see more of. That's kind of, that's kind of the kind of work you do too. <laughs> Um, well, we got a little more time. Should we? Should we the, look? This at, is um... you have to edit this out of the podcast. Oh, that's right. I'll do a cough. Right. What is, what is the sound? Bing, of the, bing of the live Q and A. Bing. All right, everybody. Jason sneezed, and we had to edit that out. Um, I see we've got some questions in the Q and A. If people can feel cool. free to submit those, you want to let's yeah. do some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we answer questions, though, everybody should uh, buy this book from Harvard Bookstore. The very nice yeah. people who hosted us having this chat. Um, all right. First comment. First question just says, hi, Jason and Kirk. I love Triple Click and I can't wait to read the book. It's not a question, but, but uh, that's very Thank nice. You. Thank you very, very much. Nice you to say. Um, okay, nice. This question uh, is, Jason, you said earlier that you'd, you'd like your next book to be focused more on one specific story. Any notions of what that might be? <laughs> <laughs> I cannot <laughs> talk about it. No, I mean, yes, I have a notion. I have a an idea that I've been noodling and um, I have to get some key people on board um, and then sign a contract before I can start talking about it. So can't talk about it yet. But yes, I do have an idea and like I very an much idea. want to do it and I'm excited about it. And if I do a third book, it might very well be this. Also, nice. one thing I guess I can talk about is like one day I would love to, this is kind of like, this is not going to happen anytime soon, but one day I would love to take all of the uh, Final Fantasy retrospectives that I did on Kotaku back in the day mm. and like beef them all up and like compile them into a big, and then write more yeah. and compile them into right. something. But that would be a little more niche than, than the books that <laughs> I've been doing. So that'll be right. down the road, like just a... a, a flight of fancy hobby project so that maybe one day. i would read that it'd but probably yes, take less like... time to read than playing final fantasy so yeah that's true I'll, I'll give you the the cliff notes in each chapter so you don't have to play them so your next book is not going to be just a series of recaps of every episode of the sopranos is that is that safe no to well say? the problem is that uh matt zoller seist and alan seppen already did <laughs> that true. So... they already kind of did the definitive book now. yeah so i can't oh, well. can't copy them but i do want to start a sopranos podcast with tim rogers so maybe maybe we'll see that one day i would listen to that okay next <laughs> question is uh, did joe cadera give a reason for not wanting to start just add combat is it just that his other consulting is going well or was there something specific about the concept that he felt wouldn't work so yeah a little more yeah, you have to read the that. book to find out. You have to read <laughs> Presser Set to find out. No, he was, yeah, he's he's a fascinating dude. He actually was t telling me a little bit about how his mentality has changed. A couple of reasons. One is that he's kind of like grown a little tired of combat and wants to work on games that are more inclusive and less about combat. And and I think Gamergate really changed him in a big way and made him feel like, man, this is this industry is not welcoming enough to people who don't just want to play the typical like combat focused mm. game and so he mm. still does a little bit of combat consulting but he also works on a lot of like non-combat stuff and and experimental vr stuff and, and that sort of thing but the other reason is that combat he doesn't think is a really good thing for outsource like he doesn't think it's something right. you can outsource very well and he talks a little bit about like how some things that are like more distant from the player are easily easier to outsource whereas stuff that like really involves the controller and getting the sticks in the player's hands are much harder to outsource I've been thinking yeah read about the book combat. for more 
yeah, there's some good quotes in there about that specific question um, that, that are very interesting. I've been thinking about combat more because I've been playing Mass Effect through because they just came out with a new Mass Effect and like how, especially the first game, the combat is, it's still kind of lousy, like they made it better, but it's still kind of lousy. And I'm like, this game does not need combat. Like I'm just kind of blowing through it because I just want the story and like to set up the next one. And how, if I were a game designer, which I'm certainly not, but if you're the kind of person who like wants to solve the trickiest problem, I would think that the trickiest problem right now would be looking at a game like Mass Effect and saying, how do we solve for this? How do we make a thing that people will like playing for 20 or 30 hours that doesn't just revolve around this endless combat loop? Because mm. combat is cool, I guess it's exciting, but you can have a game like Disco Elysium or something that doesn't have it at all if you're willing to be that daring and that, you know, that smart. And I would imagine a lot of game designers look at a game like Disco Elysium, right? And think like, whoa, like those people were trying something wild and I want to do something like that. Yeah. Um, at least well, that's, that's, that's a whole nother discussion topic, but yeah, sure. the, the question of like verbs in gaming and what verbs are actually fun, what verbs hold up over a long period of time is really interesting. Right. I always think of LA Noir, which feels very much like, I don't know a lot about the development of that game, but it feels very much like a game where the developers worked on it forever. They found that the only thing that you could do in the game was like pick up objects and interrogate people <laughs> and so then then they realized like oh crap like we need to add punching and shooting yeah. and driving to this game and that all felt incredibly tacked on and so it was kind of a mess of a game but that mm. that to me feels like an interesting example of like what go, what could go wrong when you try to do something risky yeah and that game had like a hellish development right so it's one of those games mm. where they were trying all these new things but because the development was such a nightmare for probably a lot of reasons that had nothing to do with the premise yeah. of the game like yeah. a lot of people are like gun one of those auteur of... types in charge of in yeah, charge of yeah. Game. that is a good example though of a game where and i mean david cage's games also kind of apparently nightmarish mm -hmm. to work on according mm -hmm. to some people and uh and yeah, but games that are at least trying yeah. right to, to get away from that anyways yes that's a separate topic let's move on let's get to a few more questions okay we have a question uh here do you think the labor movement in the tech industry in Silicon Valley meaningfully differs from the video game industry? For example, does the video game industry seem more aligned with other media industries which have a relatively established unions, or is it fair to lump the video game industry's labor prospects in with the rest of tech, which has not made major progress yet, like Amazon's recent loss, the incremental progress at Google and Alphabet, et cetera? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think with Amazon, I wouldn't even consider that the tech industry because the unions, the union conversation at Amazon was among warehouse workers, which is definitely not like tech jobs. Um, so, so that's a very different thing. Um, Google, yeah, I mean, there, there, there's that's more tech, actual tech as opposed to manual labor jobs. Um, but yeah, that that's another interesting question. I think that like people in the tech industry tend to be paid a lot more and so might be less inclined to unionize as opposed to game developers. But yeah, there are definitely some parallels there. I mean, there's a lot of belief in both Silicon Valley and also among like certain types of people in the games industry, a lot of belief in meritocracy and in the idea that like everyone should be out for themselves and and that like a union will just drag the most talented people down with everybody else and um yeah i mean i don't know how much uh, that is holding up potential union efforts i think the real thing that all these companies have in common is just a lot of union busting and weakened labor laws and just it's a, very easy to as a boss kind of squash union efforts in your company whether it's retali retaliatory firing or just like like veiled threats or whatever it is um we've seen that happen a lot uh in mm -hmm. tech and i'm sure it's happened in gaming as well so yeah that's that's the big, biggest issue i would say that was a striking thing um in your book and just in general getting to know more about the games industry is that people who work on video games don't necessarily make tons of money mm. and that there's it's like it's not like working at Facebook. If you work at a company that like Activision or something like that makes a ton of money, like if you're a corporate at Activision, you're probably doing okay, I guess. But like, I just, <laughs> yes. what do I know? I can't speak that broadly, but I was, I've been surprised over the years whenever I hear people share their salaries online, which was recently happening on Twitter mm -hmm. and I'll read some and I'm like, wow, like they're really getting work that's worth a lot of money out of people for not very much, yep. which does strike me as like, you would think this would kind of be right for the workers to say, hey, <laughs> wait yep. a minute. Yep. Unless you work at Riot, then you are paid quite right. well. Yeah, there um, are definitely the places that just take care of everything, yeah, which is nice. Yeah, there are a few places. Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, places, yes. More places. Yeah, 
yes, there are a few places where it's like a lot of six figure jobs, a lot of like good, stable jobs um, in the games industry. And yeah, I mean, I talk a lot about the doom and gloom, but there are definitely some places that are like healthy and taking care of their workers. The problem is with a lack of unions, you are just relying on management to treat you well. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, I mean, sometimes that can be the case for 30 years, like the rest of your life, you could be treated well by management, like that can happen for sure. But what if management changes? What if like your company gets bought because it got driven out of business by a wrestler who right. said racial <laughs> slurs like on video? Deranged right wing billionaire. And yeah. Like, um, suddenly venture capitalists buy it. And then I hypothetically, mean, pure hypothetically. hypothetical here, but uh, that could that could happen to somebody. At a, at but yes, for the most job. part, I mean, yeah, one of the most striking stories in my book is about a QA person who was making $12 an hour at Irrational Games and left for a non gaming industry and was doing the same job and making thirty dollars an hour and it's just mm -hmm. yeah it's it's some people i mean we just saw I, I was reporting last fall about people at blizzard one of the most beloved companies one of the biggest gaming companies in the world um sharing their salaries because some of them could not uh uh like live off those salaries right. and some of them just felt like they were being paid way underpaid for their roles um I saw an email that came out after that um, from someone who like emailed the company and was essentially like, like it was this heart wrenching email about how they had to quit because they just couldn't afford to work there anymore. And there was just like a lot of sad stories like that. People talking about how they would like, like skip meals to work at Blizzard. It was just, just incredibly sad, especially when you're at a lot of this is like the, the quote unquote, it's seen as unskilled positions in the games industry, like QA and like customer service mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the bottom of the food chain jobs mm -hmm. um are the really really underpaid ones that's where you're making like close to minimum wage right and there's the myth that like you're working your dream job you're working at blizzard like you should yeah. just be happy to be here that whole the blizzard thing. tax but, yeah people yeah. which people is yeah i, I actually that. like this is a tangent i liked joshua rivera's take on mythic quest that like part of the question they're asking in season two is like the cost of the dream job and and is mm -hmm. it really worth it um all right we got some more questions here cool um you talked a bit about how often workers are forced to migrate to different jobs suddenly and often were you able to sit down and chat for the book with any career designers programmers etc who saw the demise of multiple games and companies like who had to get moved around mm. multiple times yes um here's an example one person yeah. i spoke to this was like quite a twist of fate one person i spoke to um was working at 38 studios as an animator um and he was there when it imploded it was may 2012 and the company ran out of money and suddenly everybody didn't get paid their last paycheck and they all got laid off uh, a week and a half later after that and he was like man this sucks there i'm here in rhode island there aren't a lot of game companies around what am I going to do? And so he applied for a bunch of jobs and he found one job in Boston and he was like, cool, I'm going to Boston. And that company was called Irrational Games. And <laughs> two years later, Irrational Games shut down. And it's just like, man. And he he was a very optimistic person and, and kind of um, wound up doing really well because he like met all these contacts from those jobs that like led him down a freelance road and he was able to do a lot of cool stuff afterwards. Um, but not everyone is that lucky and he also had was able to get health benefits in other ways and so he could he was able to just stay in on the east coast and like keep working freelance without having to worry as much so there's a lot of like um you really have to have like extenuating circumstances to to manage and keep a, a stable role in the industry like uh, the flip side of that is that there are tons of people who have gone through multiple layoffs and then just burnt out and we're just like i'm not doing this anymore like i'm mm -hmm. going to work in software i'm going to make office apps i'm going to do web development i'm going to go to banking i'm going to go to education i'm going to go like mm -hmm. to an industry that actually values people and mm -hmm. that to me is like the biggest tragedy and it's like something we don't even know the cost of like all that brain drain and, impossible and, totally impossible to say yeah and people look around and they're like why are all these games so buggy why do these games so suck why do they seem like they're making the same mistakes as as games 10 years ago and well hey there's there's your answer brain drain mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of thing is always really hard to evaluate and kind of yep. overwhelming to even consider. Like during Me Too, this was a sort of similar thing where mm, you're like, yeah. like how many people just never even entered some of these industries or yep. totally left and we never heard about it. Could have been like the next person who made the greatest book or movie or whatever, like, you know, that you ever would have seen. And that's mm -hmm. just never going to happen because of this sort of similar. Anytime like a big systemic issue causes harm to a lot of people, it could get difficult really quickly to even yeah and there are no statistics for stuff like that like no, there's no stats like how on how many people right. just never came into the industry or burnt out 
Right. It is an important thing to point out, even in the abstract, just because it's a little horrifying, but it's an important Yeah, thing the to problem verify. is that in the abstract, it's hard to wrap your head around, like you said. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. it can be tricky. Um, okay, this question is, um, you talked about how hard it was to get a hold of Kurt Schilling. Is there anyone that was exceedingly easy to get a hold of or ask questions of or anyone who organically reached out to you? Um, yeah, I mean, I found that most of the people I reached out to were pretty easy to get a hold of um, and pretty easy to get talking. And then there were some people I reached out to who who just said no or like ignored me or whatever, um, which is fine. They're their prerogative. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people were just like, sure, yeah, I'm down to tell my story because a lot of people want to tell their stories and like feel like it's valuable to to share mm -hmm. in situations like this. Um, um, yeah, I mean, like, I can't think of anyone in the book who was really tough to, to get to talk to. Like, a couple people maybe asked questions before they would agree and were like, what's your goals here? What are, what are you trying to do here? But but pretty much everyone was just, like, pretty quickly just said, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, did anyone reach out to me? A couple people reached out to me and were like, hey, I heard you're writing a story about this studio that I work for. Let me tell you about it. Um, a lot of people... The, the the thing the story that surprised me most was Mythic because a lot of people who worked at Mythic feel really strongly about that company and so I heard from some people who were like hey I heard you're writing about Mythic I love that place it was like lightning in a bottle like we it was amazing working there and that was really interesting and and pretty cool to see um, yeah nice um, all right this is the last question though people can send in more if they would like we have a couple more yeah minutes. we have like five more minutes yeah um, this question is all right this is a kind of specific I get the sense this question you're kind of has a bone to pick with this game. Um, <laughs> okay. They're, they're right. Love the event. I will definitely pick up the book. Now my question. Paradox Games has just launched a new expansion for Europa Univer Universalis 4, which has been so buggy and broken that it has the lowest rating on Steam. During your talks with all these people, was there any discussion on the push to rush out expansions or games, I guess, um, that are not yet ready from some very successful companies and that just make them look bad? Why would they make decisions like this? Why do people <laughs> rush things out? because they're financially pressured. I mean, no, th this is not something I cover in the book. Um, right. But but this is the type of thing that you see all the time for financial. I mean, look at cyberpunk. Like, I'm sure there were all sorts of behind the scenes financial reasons. Well, there are a couple of reasons. Financial reasons are number one. But I think that like one thing that people don't really realize is that in AAA game development, especially in like the big budget game development, the line between um, a success and a failure is so thin that mm -hmm. oftentimes it's hard to tell. Even at the very end of your game's development, it's hard to tell if you're making something that's just gonna be a disaster or not because you're really fixing bugs up until the last possible minute. And it's just hard to tell like, how good your game is going to be when it's when it's like stable and optimized and everything's in all the graphics and art and sound and music like everything is in there um, which doesn't happen often until the very end of the project so there have been games that have just gone through hell like triple a development hell um shifting visions like tools that are broken um endless crunch and then they turn out to be a disaster like cyberpunk and then there are games that go through that same hell and they turn out to be masterpieces like the witcher 3. i had a um, feeling you're i was like i hope it goes with the witcher 3 for the second example that is and a so great, there's a there's this example. kind of there's like this this Fair belief reason. um from people um and sometimes it's unfounded and sometimes it is kind of founded but there's this belief from a lot of people that like oh it'll come together um bioware magic cd project magic that that's bioware what it's magic, called magic like, that's right that every was man the amount of, so this was i i really kind of realized i had always kind of realized that there was this 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 kind of like intangible um thing in the games industry where all these games just went through the same problems like really i realized that going through blood sweat and pixels but i didn't realize just how similar so many of these games were until i wrote a piece about anthem a couple of years ago and the development yeah. of that game and that was kind of widely uh, uh resonated with a lot of people because that game was such a unique disaster but also the number of Wasn't emails a i got disa afterwards. disaster exactly <laughs> that's the thing the number of emails i got afterwards that were like hey my game is like you could plug in my game's name in this story and it would be the exact same story and it's just like this is always happening in triple game development and it's wild it's bonkers it's how do people make games like i i call the book press reset um for a few reasons but part of me feels like the games industry just needs to like be like wait a minute how are we making games again let's right. boop boop let's press reset on this whole right. process Blow on the cartridge and um, we just got a couple last minute questions we could go okay. a little bit over let's take a little these bit two over and then we'll so say goodbye yeah yeah all right this one is 
has your time interviewing so many developers confronting hardships in the field affected how you experience video games yourself? Do you ever see areas in a game that you know are likely the result of bad planning to the point where you, they prevent you from enjoying the game? Actually, you would think so, but for me, no. I, I yeah. kind of just enjoy games as they are. Um, it happens that like most of the games I play are, are, well, I don't know, I play everything I can, but yeah, I don't know. I just enjoy games as they are. Like I, I don't really think about that sort of thing as I'm playing the game. Maybe occasionally I'll be like, man, this is beautiful. I'm sure this is a lot of hours going into this, but I, I find that I'm able to separate the part of me that thinks about industry issues with the part of me that just like plays games. And I think a large part of that is because I play so many of these games for like content purposes for discussing them on triple click or for writing about them and so mm -hmm. i don't want to just be constantly like ragging on on the same issues every time i play a game <laughs> like i want to be able to talk about sure. these games as they are um and then also I, I just don't think that like like the people who make these games are proud of them despite some of the hardships that they have to go through so i don't think that like anyone who worked on red dead redemption 2 wants everybody playing that game and just thinking man these people really suffered like people worked on that game are generally proud of it and like want people to enjoy it and, and think about the story and stuff although that's a weird example because there's so many parallels between that the, right. that you pointed on your review between oh, right. the game's yeah. development and the story well, there's, there's parts of that game where you play it and you're like i wonder what the creative decision making yeah. process for including yeah. this section like when they go to the islands and stuff and you're like what why are we doing this guy? yeah why, this why are we here oh maybe they came up with a bunch of assets beforehand and right and so you do kind of yeah, think about I mean, that no i do i do sometimes think about things in terms of like oh okay this is here because they copy pasted this or like right. or oh someone wow made they, it and they needed to include it yeah, like, yeah or like oh wow they like hard coded this this individual the scene that you never see anywhere like this gameplay mechanic that you never actually mm -hmm. see anywhere else in the game and wow they're never going to use it again i definitely think about it in terms of like design ways but that i think mm -hmm. is just like a good critical way of thinking about games i try not to think of it in terms of like oh man yeah, th yeah. these people went through hell to make this because i just don't think it's healthy or productive in any way makes sense um all right here's a question how do you think the current trend of mass mergers and acquisitions affects the game development labor force that's the hmm. you know it's will it be smaller for small devs and larger companies to advocate for themselves like is this going to be a problem mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. I, it's an interesting question i mean i think it leads to more stability i always think about double fine um and yep. the double fine documentary if you're watching this if you're if you're still on this call you probably care about how games are made go watch the double fine adventure it's documentary so which is on yeah. youtube it's free and it's the best thing i've ever seen or read or well not read it's the best thing i've ever seen on making <laughs> games um but that they talked during that process, Double Fine, the studio, they talked about how, like, every single game they made, it was like, we really need that big hit. Like, we're bouncing from publisher to publisher, contract to contract, and we have to take all these bad contracts because we're unstable and we need the money. And it's just really a brutal look at, like, what they go through as an indie developer. And then a few years later, they're purchased by Microsoft. And on one hand, it's such a, like, bummer that this studio could not stay independent. But on the other hand, it's like, wow, now they have money and they're stable and they don't really have to worry as much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to unpack when it comes to like acquisitions and sometimes it can lead more to more stability. Sometimes it's like the, the kind of the traditional merger and acquisition thing is um, big company buys studio big company leaves studio alone for a few years, then big company maybe has a management shakeup or a change in direction. And they're like, actually, let's go look at what studio is doing. And then <laughs> the problems start. And so like <laughs> you get a few years of independence and then a few years after that, it's like, okay, now we all got to leave. Um, right. And then there's like happens the on a simultaneous, big scale, the like vestment leaving like everybody is like okay now my contractual yep. like yep. obligation yep. is yep. up and we're all out the door exactly yeah my happen. four years um uh, are my golden handcuffs are done mm -hmm. now i can leave yep exactly i'm smiling but it's usually a bummer when that happens <laughs> okay there is one more question that's very short jason okay i need to know asks our final question asker what is a teraflop <laughs> Um, I think it's a thing that I had to change in my toilet because it stopped flushing and now, now it works. I was going to say it's when like Tara's Sprite lies down on the ground mm -hmm. when she flops. It's a Got Tara it. Flop. Tara from Final Fantasy VI. Of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. She flops. Would, that's what I would, I would say. All right. I think that'll, uh, I think that'll do it with that very informative Beautiful. final answer for the question. I think we're done. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Kirk. And thank you, Benjamin, for having us. Yeah. Thanks, Benjamin. Of course. Thank you for joining us. This has been such a fantastic and delightful conversation. Um, and thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your evening with us. 
please learn more about this incredible book and purchase Press Reset at harvard.com. I've put the link to purchase it in the chat a couple times. So on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy the rest of your week. Keep reading, keep gaming, and stay safe, everyone. <laughs> All right. Bye.